the four means of proof um, in index hot, pratyaksh, which is the empirically manifest, uh, anuman, which is inference, upman, which is analogy, and shabd, uh, which is shabd praman, as we call it, testimony or authority. And all Indian thought uh, systems, right, accept pratyaksh. And the world's first recorded use of the experimental method was by piety. Right? So Anuman or reasoning was used to infer from local observations, for instance, that the earth is round. Right? So there were many such um, uh, instances where um, physically as well as mathematically, this was kind of seen. And um, Professor yeah. Uh, Raju, will be talking. Yeah. yeah, Professor Raju. And I just want to make a few points. Sure. Yes. So uh, let me make those points. I mean, the first thing is that uh, there have been, when we talk about Indian tradition, there have been all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of things being stated, all right, which are major bloopers. Uh, for example, if we, you know, I mean, uh, uh, to start with a joke, there was this issue about space travel that you have Bharadwaj Rishi and so on. This was came in the papers. Then there is this issue about Vedic mathematics. You can see my article in the Hindu. I can't, unfortunately, show it. But um, I mean, uh, because I can't share the slide. But uh, there are a number of uh, such cases where various things have happened. And uh, I think uh, the last case was about the Pythagorean theorem where uh, Dr. Harshwardhan said, you know, that we were the first to give it. Now, the point is, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with that in it is that the school text doesn't say that the Greeks did it first. It says that the Greeks did it better. So if you want to make a point, you have to make the correct point, And it is assumed, or one does assume, that uh, you do know about uh, the class 9 text. No, it shouldn't happen that you don't know about the class line text. That is a real blooper. So there are a lot of comments that I've written also to Atul Kothari and so on, which are there on my blog. But uh, the point is, why are there so many blunders? And uh, I think that, you see, the central issue is just this, that we are damaging the credibility of Indian tradition by talking this kind of loose stuff. And the reason to talk this kind of loose stuff is, you know, I was giving a talk in, um, I mean, let me, uh, let me put it, uh, let me summarize it. The knowledgeable people have their proof, uh, have their loyalty to proof. Politicians, they need to prove reliable. So they have loyalty and they demonstrate it and they expect loyalty. So what happens is that uh, there is a major difference if you are, uh, whether you are uh, uh, giving proof of loyalty or whether your loyalty is to proof. And because uh, they value loyalty instead of knowledge, they don't have that basic knowledge and they go on making these errors. And these errors are very damaging to Indian tradition and if one expects that if one wants to talk about these things, there should be a certain minimum of preparation before talking about it. Anyway, so that is uh, the first point that I want to make, that uh, we are uh, not, uh, we are damaging the credibility of Indian tradition by doing this. The second point I want to make is, if we do look at the notion of proof, we see this in the Nyaya Sutra, Nyaya Sutra 2. I would like to have, I would have uh, liked to show it to you. It is um, simply four aspects Pratyaksh, Anuman, Upman, and Shab. So these are the four things that constitute Praman according to the Nyaya Sutra 2. So there are various differences and differences of opinion that Nyaya Sutra 2 is not the only one uh, which uh, talks about uh, proof. So uh, the, uh, apart, I mean, for example, if you look at what the Buddhists said, the Buddhists rejected uh, the uh, rejected. Upman, that is analogy, 
and the Buddhists rejected uh, Shab because they said we do not accept authority. The argument was that uh, if something is uh, is it must be either if Shab is reliable. The reliability must be either pratyaksh or it must be inferred. And therefore, you need only pratyaksh and anuman or inference. So, uh, this was the case. And so, that prima facie, accepting pratyaksh, which is the empirical, and accepting anuman, which means reasoning, it shows that Indian tradition was prima facie scientific. And uh, in fact, there were experiments performed. You see the case of um, you know ultra chauvinistic um, Western history, which says that the experimental method began with Francis Bacon. He was a corrupt rascal who was superstitious and said that the word of God. I'm quoting from the Novum Organum, which is one of his major writings. The word of God is the surest medicine against superstition. Now, can you really believe that? So uh, this is what Francis Bacon said, and you say experimental method began with him. It's, but in, on the contrary, if you see Payasi, Payasi Sut is in the Dhiganikai. It is the uh, long uh, speeches of the Buddh. It is part of that collection. And there he describes a series of some 30 experiments with dying persons to experiment. They are actually experiments. You know, for example, you take a man you uh, condemn felon, you weigh him, then strangle him so that no blood is uh, shed and then weigh him again. So these are experiments that are being performed to see if there is any loss of weight because of the escape of the soul. So he performed these kinds of experiments, about 30 of them, and we have a record of this. So this shows that the experimental method existed in India because it applied to something which no Westerner had ever applied it to. The belief in life after death. So Payasi was trying to refute the belief in life after death. But anyway, our point is that at the moment that uh, the uh, experimental method existed in India, the other thing is Anuman, reasoning. Just because you accepted empirical proof does not mean you did not accept reasoning. There are lots of people who will talk this kind of it's a rather foolish caricature. We keep, I keep encountering it. Oh, you believe in empirical? You can't believe in reasoning. See, science believes in empirical. It also reasons. And exactly the same was true in India. And a concrete example is Aryabhat, who in World 6 asserts that the Earth is round. Why does he assert that the Earth is round? Did he go in a spaceship out to space to see? No. It was deduced. And Lalla explains that, that far off trees cannot be seen. If the earth were flat, you should be able to see them. And you see that, uh, you know, ship uh, disappears over the horizon. And uh, based on that, Indians calculated the size of the earth. And I explained this technique to my students. I could have shown you how it is done. It's a very easy process. Measure the height of a mountain. You climb the mountain and measure the dip of the horizon. And you get a very accurate estimate of the size of the earth. So, this was being inferred. So this is proper science that was being done. And this is completely contrary to, you know, uh, the usual ultra chauvinistic Western myths. So, for example, the Latin Bible, the Vulgate asserts in Daniel 10, 11, that uh, you, uh, the, there was a tree which was so tall that, uh, you know, it could be seen from the ends of the earth. And the Vulgate is uh, contemporaneous with the 5th century Aryabhat. All right. Then there is the issue of Upman. So Aryabhat does use analogy when he says that the earth is like a Kadam flower. So Kadam flower, I could show you, unfortunately I can't, is round. So, but he is not inferring anything from that. He is only making a pedagogical use of that, an expository use of that. He's not drawing any conclusions. But in contemporary science, general relativistic cosmology makes essential use of analogy. See, the basic Friedman models are obtained by solving the Hilbert-Einstein equations for the stress energy tensor, which is that of a perfect fluid. Now, what is a perfect fluid? 
and you can write down a stress energy tensor that it is rho plus p and u mu u nu with the velocity p. I can't show you the equation. I'm sorry, I have written it down. This is a problem with stream yard. So, uh, in Newtonian physics, point is the stress energy tensor involves some quantities called density and pressure. Now, what is density? What is pressure? <coughs> in Newtonian physics, density and pressure are statistical averages due to random molecular motion. But in GRT, there are no molecules. You can't talk of molecules or molecular motion because you don't have a proper description of matter. And there is no relativistically invariant probability measure to describe randomness and with respect to which you are going to take average. So this is pure analogy and it is an inapplicable analogy, but it is widely used because all your cosmology is based on this assumption. And it is an essential use. And I can also quickly tell you the reason for it. The reason is that uh, the equations of general relativity were derived by Hilbert, not by Einstein. Einstein not only stole uh, special relativity from Poincaré, he stole general relativity from Hilbert. And uh, Hilbert was looking at geometry because that was Poincaré's idea that force in Newtonian physics can be eliminated by an appropriately modified geometry. You just choose, for example, if you have constraints, you choose an appropriate manifold and all the forces disappear, which is what Hilbert did. So he was concerned with geometry, not the characterization of matter. That is why analogy becomes essential because of this sort of stuff. Now let's look at Shabda Praman. Shabda Praman is also used in India, for example, in the Manav Shulba Sutra 10.10, .10, which uh, asserts, uh, you know, ayamam, ayamam, gunam, vistaram, vistarentu, samasya vargamulam, yat tat karna tad vidu. So, you know, tad vidu vidu, this is an assertion that. Uh, you are so said knowledgeable. That is because the author of the Manav Shruta Sutra is an artisan. He is not himself a knowledgeable Ganitakya. And therefore, he invokes proof by authority that this is what the knowledgeable say. So, anyway, point I am making, I think, let me just summarize that the Indian method of proof is prima facie scientific. And in fact, it regards Analogy and uh, authority as very weak methods of proof because authority has no place in science, really speaking. But unfortunately, authority permeates contemporary science. It is a case of refutability with a P versus Popper's refutability. So we are not looking at in contemporary science how we validate it. Is it refuted? Has it published? Is it published in a reputed journal? Not about experiment. You write any nonsense in a reputed journal, that is okay. So the assumption is it is not going to be nonsense. Why not? Because it has been secretively peer reviewed. A secrecy, what, what does it add to science? Certainly doesn't add to truth because we know how these things can be managed. Anybody who has been in academics, if you know the editor, obviously all these things can be managed and done. So anyway, it is um, valued, then you do things like citation index. What is citation index? It's a measure of popularity. So if you have a very popular novel, then it must be the best possible novel. Is that how we do things? Or you have impact parameter. So impact parameter will, uh, it's a racist measure because it assumes, I mean, I remember A.K. Raichaudhri, Yamal Kumar Raichaudhri of Raichaudhri equation uh, pointing this out. Why do you think nature, nature is a better journal? Just because, do you think the, uh, the viewers of nature are better? It assumes that Western peer reviewers are superior. This belief is problem. It is like uh, saying Indians and dogs not allowed. So the method of validation is problematic. It makes scientific truth subordinate to Western authority. And I've discussed this further in my little booklet, Ending Academic Imperialism. Point I'm making, let me summarize. Contemporary science relies on methods of proof rejected as weak in Indic thought, particularly analogy and authority. Okay, so far so good. These are things which are well known. Now the new thing that I want to talk about is 
formal mathematics because contemporary science uses formal mathematics and this is an even more insidious method of smuggling proof by western authority into contemporary science so formal mathematics you know uh, i just to give you some example quantum mechanics begins with the separable hilbert space now what is the separable hilbert space most people won't know right or the propagators of quantum field theory if you look at them in configuration space they are short distributions or if you look at the white man axioms then you say that uh, you know the uh, quantum mechanics begins with uh, your uh, uh, operator value tempered distributions and i am pretty sure chichid roy has been doing quantum mechanics i have known him for the last 40 years you know more than 40 years and he was doing quantum mechanics then i'm sure he'll have a problem with this kind of thing what are operator value tempered distributions so most people won't know now when you don't know what do you do you have to ask whom do you ask to ask somebody who is an authority anyway so this is how authority gets smuggled in to uh, science at the very core i mean how do you do quantum mechanics you start with a state vector which sits in hilbert space and then you say schrodinger equation is going to be a unitary group and so on i don't want to get into that let's look at simple newtonian physics so you are using differential equations whether i am not going to schrodinger equation or whatever it's a simple ordinary differential equations you may have or partial differential equations you may have euler lagrange equations the maxwell equations etc any kind of differential equation needs calculus and our text we teach i am sure they teach this in uh, institute of science they teach it everywhere calculus needs real numbers now what are real numbers they are unreal the terminology is uh, very wrong they are not uh, really real numbers so they are unreal numbers and uh, point is real numbers are defined only in formal math i mean indians developed calculus they did not need real numbers they need the things like square root of 2 and pi and so on but they did not call them real numbers they knew that it is an infinite series expansion which does not terminate but there is a difference between that knowledge and between saying that you have a metaphysical real number where the entire infinite series can somehow be summed so point is simple point is formal mathematics prohibits the empirical in a formal mathematical proof empirical has no place you cannot say i observe this and therefore it is true all right that could be completely wrong and this is stated even in our uh, class 9 text beware of what you can see so if you can see it it is wrong it is no part of formal math empirical pratyaksha is no part of formal math so it is reasoning ganit is reasoning plus the empirical but formal math is reasoning minus the empirical so this prohibition of empirical and formal math board seal for science if you are going to use formal math in science and you do use it you do use it whether it's in quantum mechanics or in general relativity or wherever else and the problem is that we have a phenomenon which i call post colonial mathematical illiteracy i'm sorry but i do mean exactly what i'm saying post colonial mathematical illiteracy most people do not know why 1 plus 1 equal to 2 in real numbers it is very unfortunate i have been giving huge prizes for this i am willing to offer prizes again i am not a rich man but uh, this is really really uh, bad that uh, people don't understand they don't read their class class 9 text which prohibits the empirical that you should be got deceived by what you see and therefore don't rely on it rely only on axioms what are axioms they are postulates the class 9 te text tell you that but what is a postulate it is a metaphysical postulate it's not a postulate about the real world it is a fantasy it's a fantasy approved or laid down by western authority it's a fantasy usually about infinity no points are they don't have any size lines are infinitely thin no real line no uh, line in the real world is going to be infinitely thin so uh, these are fantasies so this diverse of uh, divorce of formal math from empirical can be checked by reading any text on mathematical logic 
I've been talking about it for 20 years. You can read my Hawaii keynote from 2000, or you can read my Durban keynote from 2017 to now. And the basic cause, why do you want to prohibit the empirical? How is it, how is science going to benefit? It's not going to benefit. The church benefited because this method of proof originated with the church during the crusade when the church wanted to use reasoning to prove things. And it could not tolerate the empirical because where are angels? Where is God? Where is heaven? You can't produce any empirical proof of any of those things. So, but people don't know. They don't know formal math. They are frightened of math. And they are frightened of math because they don't understand. However, what happens is they have what I call the it works superstition. I think you need to think about this. It works. They feel, oh, it works. Anywhere you go. I mean, uh, whether it's in uh, Malaysia or Iran or Palestine or wherever, you have these uh, people saying this all the time. Oh, they have sent a man to the moon. They have sent a rocket to the moon. So it works. But it works. What works? See, it works is also used by astrologers to defend astrology. They would say it works. So there are two problems. Does it really work and what works? So in the case of mathematics, the problem is what works. And the superstitious don't know because they never calculated a rocket trajectory. How do you calculate the rocket trajectory? I have done it. I teach it. It's very simple. The calculation uses normal math, not, form, not formal math. So what works is normal math. The credit goes to formal math. It is like, you know, slave and master. Slave does the work, master gets the money. So easiest proof that calculation of rocket trajectories is normal math is that trajectories are calculated on computers today. NASA does it on computers, so does this road do. So what do computers use? They cannot use real numbers. They use floating point numbers. They are completely distinct from formal real numbers because of floating point numbers, even the associative law for addition does not hold. I have an example. Uh, you have a program. You can see a C program. I've been giving it for the last 20 years. I'm tired of talking about it. You can see these latest articles on calculus in Bology. I had a reference, but I'll put this up afterwards. So the point is that um, it works is a bad superstition because you don't know what works. And the basic uh, confusion arises because actually if you see more school math, whether you're looking at arithmetic or algebra or trigonometry and especially calculus, it was normal math which went to Europe from India. So arithmetic, for example, Arabic numerals or algorithms or zero or algebra, which was object, which was translated by uh, Al Khwarizmi as uh, Algebra Bal Mukabla, probability and statistics. So I have an article on that. So all this stuff went as normal math except for geometry. And uh, anyway, let me, uh, when it came back, it came back as formal man after colonization. So let me again summarize. Formal math prohibits the empirical, but is used in com contemporary science. So it is used to slip in all kinds of metaphysical assumptions without people knowing or understanding. Example is Penrose Hawking, Penrose uh, Hawking singularity theory, and I've written about it. So it is, it play, can be used to play havoc. So it works. What works in math is because in practice, normal math is used, not formal math. Everywhere, whether you go to a shop or whether you uh, are doing a uh, calculating a rocket trajectory or you are doing uh, artificial intelligence or you're doing machine intelligence or whatever, whatever statistics you're using, you are not using Lebesgue measure. You are defining Lebesgue measure, but what you use will be always some simple calculation. So, third point is that math went to in, went to Europe from India as normal math, but was returned as formal math. The same thing was given a coating. It is possible to formalize anything. It was formalized and returned to India during colonialism and declared to be superior. Now, I want to take especially the case of calculus. That in the 16th century, as you know, protein based Jesuits translated and sent Indian texts to Rome. Why did they do that? Because they wanted the precise trigonometric values. What for? For the European navigational problem. Please remember when they came, India was very rich, Europeans were very poor. And their dreams of European dreams of wealth rested on overseas trade or piracy or whatever else. And for that, to bring the wealth back home, 
they have to have good navigation because the ship sinks, all the wealth is gone. So it was a very big problem in Europe. So they sent these texts to translate it and sent these texts to Rome from where they diffused. First went to Galileo, who had access to the, I mean, first went to Tycho Brahe, to Galileo, uh, to uh, uh, Christoph Clavius, to Julius Caligar, and so on. And then from there, uh, it went to Kepler, also it went to Galileo, to Cavalieri, to Fermi, Pascal, Newton, and Leibniz. And they have a very rotten principle called the doctrine of distant discovery, on which they say, you know, Vasco da Gama discovered India. What you people, you exist here, you did not matter. Like they killed everybody in the Americas. So they don't matter. The doctrine of Christian discovery says first Christian to sight a piece of land becomes its owner. It is part of current US law. I've talked about it, won't talk about it. So when you say Newton discovered capitalists, that is what it means. It's a doctrine of Christian discovery, it applies. And the problem is my epistemic test that those who steal knowledge don't fully understand it. So Newton, Leibniz, Descartes, they did not understand what the calculus was basically, as I said, those who steal do not understand, like students who cheat and copy in an exam, they understand something, but not all of it. So Europeans could derive some practical value from calculus as the numerical solution of differential equations. They could obtain the precise trigonometric values, but they did not understand how to sum an infinite series. Infinite series was summed in India, how Indians did it? Milkant in his Aryabhatiya Bhashya, Ganit 70s, commentary on Ganit 17, I can't show it to you, unfortunately. He summed it by a process, I cannot explain it in five minutes to people who don't even know what uh, maybe, uh, what exactly is meant by convergence and so on and so forth, what is meant by real numbers. So he used non-Archimedean arithmetic, that is means he did not use real numbers, because real numbers are Archimedean. And non-Archimedean arithmetic has infinitesimals. And then you discard those infinitesimals on the philosophy of zeroism or shunyavad. I can't go into all that. The point is, it is only a Western superstition that math is exact. You prove Pythagorean theorem exactly, but it doesn't apply anywhere in the real world. Because if you apply it on the uh, surface of the Earth, it is curved. If you apply it in space, space also is curved. So it doesn't apply. It applies approximately. So you say exactitude in a fantasy world versus approximation or inexactitude in the real world. So Indians did inexactitude in the real world. That is what Ganesh is about. So anyway, the Western failure to understand led to the real numbers because they acknowledged that uh, uh, they did not understand and therefore Dedekind invented real numbers. And uh, this was in the 19th century, late 19th century. But they used Cantorian set theory, which was Bunkum, full of paradoxes, you had to wait till axiomatic set theory, which came in the 1930s. So that's when real numbers came. Now, the point is, the critical part, I would like to, I don't know how many, how much time I have spent, but uh, I would like two, three minutes more, not more than that. So the point is, we teach calculus today in that inferior way, which destroys the core of Indic thought. Why do I say it destroys the core of Indic thought? Because the whole idea of Atman and Moksha or Dharma needs quasi-cyclic time. And real numbers force superlinear time in physics. And this is done not on the basis of any physical observation, but purely due through the metaphysics of formal math. And Westerners understand that conflict between real numbers and core Indic thought. You know, I gave a talk in Berlin. You can see my video of my talk that quasi-cyclic time versus the super linear time of current physics forced by real numbers. So you can see that, or I gave a talk, but Indians don't get it. I gave a talk on this at the 25th Vedant Congress. Presentation is online. The video has not been made public by Dr. Balram. I believe he'll be speaking next. A video recording I did not get uh, because basically people think it is of no importance. So anyway, to give the summary, calculus was stolen from India, hence poorly understood by Europeans. Hence, real numbers invented. And this use damages the core of Indian thought. I mean, you can forget about everything else if you don't have this. So, question is, what should we do? We were fooled many times. We are told that real numbers with math, real numbers are rigorous, they are superior. It's just like saying whites are superior to blacks. Right? That you are prohibiting 
प्रत्यक्ष एंटी साइंस तो दे ट्राई टू करेक्ट थिंग्स एंड ब्रॉट एन अल्टरनेटिव फोर्स एंड कैलकुलस यूज द स्टेनिंग कैलकुलस बट इंडियंस आर नॉट विलिंग टू डिस्कस दिस एंड द मोस्ट इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग इज दैट द थीसिस ऑफ द कैलकुलस वाज स्टोलन फ्रॉम इंडिया वाज इटसेल्फ स्टोलन वाज इटसेल्फ स्टोलन इट वाज प्लेजराइज्ड राइट इन द ईयर 2000 एंड काक रोट एन आर्टिकल क्लेमिंग थ्री ब्रिटिशर्स हैव सेड दैट कैलकुलस ओरिजिनेटेड इन इंडिया actually there were three christians two with indian passports one was my post doctoral fellow one was a russian and none of them knew sanskrit or math or indian history so i have written about it in my book plagiarism was exposed there was a uh, ethics committee there was a newspaper article and there were lots of mistakes but the gullible can be fooled again and again and so there was a huge article again in 2007 which said that these two fellows from manchester that the sub and almeida same chap they cheated again and okay that was again only hindustan times it came in the front page of all newspapers only hindustan times published the retraction then more recently pantajan interviewed me but it believed that fake news from 2007 and ended by praising the serial plagiarists so the point is we have systemic problems because we have terrific amount of faith in the reliability of western sources that is what colonialism taught us and there is a glamour we did it first the failure to understand that we not only did it first we did it different we did it better for example the calendar for example the method of doing geometry but we are unable to teach that difference because of a blind desire to imitate the west so calculus was stolen poorly understood hence real numbers they damaged the core of index thought i cannot explain it in such short time but there are many practical advantages to in calculus with limit let me conclude Indian thought was scientific, accepted, pratyaksh, but rejected analogy and authority as weak. But contemporary science accepts analogy based heavily on Western social approval and authority. And uh, contemporary science uses formal math, which is far more insidious, which prohibits the empirical, forcing reliance on Western authority. And what works is normal math. Formal math just grabs the credit, and through formal math, judge superstitions about infinity and eternity. Creeping into science, and they are fatal to the core of Indian thought. Thank you. I'm sorry this thing did not work. I have warned about it. It always fails. Often yes, fails. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, yes, sir you did. Um, well, we use StreamYard usually at the Gyan Bharati, uh, but we will try to kind of, you know, uh, resolve this. Yes, uh, yeah. and, and we definitely want to, uh, you know, host you for a longer kind of, you know, expansion on many of the yeah. points which I uh, feel is very are very relevant and very important. Um, I have one uh, interesting question that has come through. It's actually in three parts. Uh, I'd like uh, you to please condense and you know uh, try to address as much as you can. Uh, are these four pramanas truly independent in nature? Is shabd praman based on someone else's pratyaksh or anuman? or am i making a basic mistake in understanding the concept of pramanas itself <clears throat> a shabd praman is based on hearsay what somebody else has it could be based on somebody else's pratyaksh for example when you call a witness in legal testimony you are asking for a shabd praman which is uh, what he saw but the point is the question is how is it reliable is the reliability has to is it manifest that the person is uh, honest or it is inferred that okay this chap did this and therefore so in that sense shabd praman is uh, not really independent of those two at least that is the buddhist objection right. so it's not independent yeah so i think uh, yes so that was the primary main question the one question we had um so sir i would like to thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts and insights today um as i said i think there are so there's so much to kind of uh, expand on and uh, we would be uh, very uh, grateful if you if we could host you uh, for a longer kind of you know uh, uh, discussion on this uh, thank you so much for no, sharing that's your opinion yeah. <laughs> do it Sounds on zoom sir? or something else oh yes <laughs> right sir we will we will definitely look into that as well <laughs> yeah okay But, yes sir thank you thank you so much right. yeah. thank you